For several years now, we've been training facilitators across the state of Kentucky. And together, the Kentucky Cancer Program and you and Dr. Clayton have trained over a thousand facilitators across the state. What is the one thing you want facilitators to take from that training? It's been a work of love. And the thing that I would hope that they would take with them is to learn to count. Now, let me describe this to you. Webster gives two definitions for the word count. The first one is to add up a series of numbers or items or events. Uh, I'll give you an example of this. A lady went into a hairdresser and she said, now Mary, do an especially good job today because I'm getting married tomorrow. And Mary said, well, Miss Jones, how many times does this make? And she says, this is my fourth and last. She said, the fourth time? Yes, said I. Listened to a nursery rhyme when I was six years old and had a profound effect on my life. And I've patterned my life after that nursery rhyme. She said, well, what was the nursery rhyme? She said, well, you recall my first marriage was to a banker. Uh, I then married an actor. I then married a minister. And now my fourth and final marriage is going to be to a mortician. She said, well, well, what was the nursery rhyme? She says, one for the money, two for the show, three to make ready, and four to go. <laughs> well, that's counting, but that's not exactly what I want for these facilitators. Uh, counting is somewhat different. Uh, an, an elderly man who had built a business and had put his oldest son through medical school, and the next son was a successful high school principal, and the daughter now had just finished her CPA training. He had bought and paid for his home and educated his three children and had a wonderful life. And the new CPA came home and she said, now dad, now that I have my CPA, I would like to see your profit and loss statement. He said, well, let me see. So I came to this country 40 years ago, owning nothing but the shirt on my back and the pants on my back. Said I built this business, paid for it. I built the home that you and your brothers grew up in. Uh, I've educated a successful physician and a high school principal and now you're a CPA and I've had a wonderful life. Now if you add all of that up and subtract the pants and the shirt, I guess what's left must be profit. <laughs> well, that, that's closer, Jamie, but that, that's not really the definition that I want to apply to our facilitators. The second definition that Webster gives of count is to do something of value, something of significance. That is what I'm hoping for these people. Albert Einstein said one time, seek not to be a person of success, rather to be a person of value. That's getting closer. Mm -hmm. Rabbi Hillel said this. He said, if I'm not for myself, who will be for me? If I'm not for others, what am I? And if not now, when? He suggests that there's some urgency and I need to do something for others. R.L. Sharp wrote a, an interesting poem that, that I, I like to refer to, and he says, isn't it strange how princes and kings and clowns that caper in sawdust rings and common folk like you and me are build us for eternity? Each is given a bag of tools, a shapeless mass, a book of rules, and each must fashion if life has flown a stumbling block or a stepping stone. So they've given us some guidance. They've given us some direction as to how we might become better at counting, to learn to count. Let's look at some other clues in our society. A gentleman by the name of, of uh, Hans Selye established the first correlation between stress and physical illness. And let me define stress to you. Stress is the term that is used in the medical literature to describe the changes that occur in my body anytime I feel threatened. So anytime I feel threatened, my body, the pupils dilate, breathing increases in rate, the heart rate increases, blood goes from the surface of the skin to the muscles to prepare us for what Dr. Cannon called a fight or flight phenomenon. So the body prepares itself for war. Now Dr. Cannon said fight or flight phenomenon is real and that's a part of us. Dr. Selye said, if we keep ourselves in situations where we are constantly agitated or we overreact to normal situations and we keep our body in this state of agitation, we prevent the brain from doing its most vital function, which is to protect the body. Mm -hmm. And so Dr. Selye gave us some advice. 
He said, a long, healthy, and happy life is the result of making contributions, of having meaningful projects that are personally exciting and contribute to and bless the lives of others. I like that. Mm -hmm. A long, healthy, and happy life is the result of making contributions, of having meaningful projects that are personally exciting and contribute to and bless the lives of others. I think Dr. Celia has given us some good advice. Alfred Lloyd Tennyson, a number of years ago, and Mr. Tennyson suffered a tragic loss in 1833 when his dearest friend died at the age of 22. Uh, his dearest friend now uh, was engaged to Tennyson's brother, uh, to his sister, by the way. Tennyson taught us how to deal with grief. Mr. Tennyson spent 17 years writing a poem called In Memoriam A.H.H., and he dedicated it to his deceased friend. And one of the phrases of that poem, he says, I hold it true whate'er befall, I feel it when I sorrow most. Tis better to have loved and lost than never to have loved at all. So Selye's taught us how to live. Tennyson taught us how to deal with grief. If I could summarize the, the things that I've observed in 79 years of watching people, Jimmy, there are two types of people in this world. They're the grabbers and they're the givers. Let me describe the grabber to you. The grabber has a little piece of land about this size, and the grabber's needs are very simple. All the grabber wants is that piece of land and all the land that touches that piece of land. Having acquired the larger mass, now all the grabber wants is that larger piece of land and all the land that touches it. Having acquired the even larger mass, you see, the grabber of that definition will never be happy. Mm -hmm. The happy people are those who have learned to give. They have learned what Dr. Selye said, a long, healthy, and happy life is the result of making contributions, of having meaningful projects that are personally exciting and contribute to and bless the lives of others. Our facilitators have the opportunity to make major contributions to the people in their community. Mm -hmm. They have the opportunity to literally change lives. If a mother smokes, her daughter is two and one half times more likely to smoke. You get the mother off cigarettes and you probably have prevented another member of that family from smoking. So we've got to start someplace. Our people are givers. The givers are the happy people of this world. They know what the Dr. Selye was talking about. A long, healthy, and happy life is the result of making contributions, of having meaningful projects that are personally exciting and contribute to and bless the lives of others. And if givers wrote poetry, they might write something like this. Have you ever seen a fellow what had been and stubbed his toe? And is crying by the roadside, sort of quiet like and slow. A holding of that dusty foot all hard and brown and barren, trying to keep back from his eyes the tears that's gathering there. You hear him sort of sobbing like and, and sniffing of his nose. You stop and pat him on the head and try to ease his woes. You treat him sort of kind like, and first thing you know, he's up and off and running, clean forgot about that toe. Along the road of human life, you meet a man who's traveling slow. And like it's not, he's some poor chap what's been and stubbed his toe. He was making swimming headway, but he bumped into a stone, and his friends went hurrying onward and left him all alone. He ain't sobbing. He ain't sniffing. He's too old for sobs and cries, but he's grieving just as earnest if it only comes in size. And it does a heap of good sometimes to go a little slow and give a word of kindness to that man who stubbed his toe. Because you're never sure yourself. There ain't no earthly way to know just when it's going to come your time to trip and stub your toe. Today you're smiling happy in the warm sun's heat and glow, and tomorrow you're shivering as you're trudging through the snow. Just when you think you got the world the fastest in your grip, it's the very time you'll find that you're the likeliest to slip. And it does a heap of good sometimes, I know, to stop and kind of hold you when you've been as stubs your toe. So that's what I want for our facilitators. I want them to learn to count, to make a difference. Well, thank you so much for sharing that. And the Kentucky Cancer Program is very grateful to you and Dr. Clayton both for being givers yourself and, of course, sharing this program with us statewide. 
And if you'd like more information on how you can become a facilitator and change lives here in Kentucky as well, feel free to call the Kentucky Cancer Program. The number is at the bottom of your screen. Thank you so much.